There needs to be a very robust framework for oversight, for enforcement, and for monitoring of where these funds, if they are in fact released through this trust fund um, proposal by the Biden administration, how that money is, is used and dispersed. But I, I think you know that there's just more of a wishful thinking among many within Afghanistan and outside that there wasn't a policy alternative or legal possibility that the Biden administration through fiat could just cut a $7 billion check to the Taliban. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, February 15th, 2022. The Biden administration on Friday notified a court of a novel proposal to dispose of $7 billion in frozen Afghanistan assets. It produced some pretty confusing media and a lot of anger, and we thought we would try to unpack it. So joining me in the virtual jungle studio today is Alex Zerden, the founder and principal of Capital Peak Strategies and the former lead of the Treasury Department's office at the U.S. Kabul Embassy. Alongside him was Lawfare's senior editor, Scott R. Anderson, who needs no introduction. We talked about what the Biden administration did in its executive order on Friday. We talked about how the media subtly got it wrong. We talked about what the implications are for pending litigation and for providing relief to the Afghan people. And we talked about whether the administration has successfully threaded a needle. It's the Lawfare Podcast, February 15th. The Biden administration and Afghanistan's frozen assets. All right, Scott, get us started. This action by the Biden administration took a lot of people by surprise on Friday, and it certainly, I think, caught some press flat footed. What happened and how did it play in media about it? Sure. Uh, well, unfortunately, those are two very different things or somewhat different things, um, which is a situation I'm sure the Biden administration is not happy to have found itself in, in that its actions are being interpreted a little differently than I think what they actually do, as far as I can tell, at least. If you read a lot of the headlines, a lot of the commentary that's come out around this move, what they are saying the Biden administration is doing is taking $7 billion in assets owned by the Central Bank of Afghanistan called Da Afghanistan Bank or DAB, a DAB, taking those assets and basically splitting them in half, taking half and transferring it to some determined third party trust arrangement for which that's going to be used for the benefit of the Afghan people. Not clear exactly what that means. The administration's very open saying we're still working out the exact details, but basically to be put towards a purpose for the benefit of the Afghan people and the other half being given to survivors of the 9-11 attacks who have been engaged in litigation against a variety of parties, but among them the Taliban, uh, to pay off certain judgments they have against the Taliban. In fact, if you look at the executive order that came out on Friday and a related statement of interest the Justice Department filed in a related court case, it's actually pretty clear in my eyes that the Biden administration is doing something a little bit different here. It is, in fact, taking that $3.5 billion and putting it in a separate trust arrangement. We can talk about why that is. I actually think that has more to do with protecting it, frankly, uh, than it does with trying to turn it towards any sort of alternate purpose and also making it available to Afghans as opposed to sitting in the kind of state of suspended am animation that most Afghan sovereign assets have been in since August, since there is no recognized government of Afghanistan. And then for the remaining bit where press accounts have imply that they are essentially giving this money to 9-11 plaintiffs, it's actually not what's happening. I and mean, they're actually pretty clear that they are essentially saying these assets are going to stay place. We're going to maintain the status quo with these assets so that existing legal proceedings that are already in place trying to attach them can play out. Uh, and they actually submitted the statement of interest in the course of that litigation, which points out many of the problems with those plaintiff's arguments, reasons why those assets actually may never get to those plaintiffs in the first place, because legally that's they're not actually entitled to them. But that, that didn't really get picked up in the press. Instead, it was seen as kind of somehow giving these assets to pay off uh, for the 9-11 attacks. And that understandably, I think, has a lot of Afghans, a lot of people who are very sympathetic with the plight of Afghans in Afghanistan right now, which is very dire, the wrong way. But I think it's worth digging into the details to clarify why that's that's not clear what's happening here. In fact, I think the Biden administration is still, instead of wrestling with some really difficult legal terrain that it doesn't entirely control, in, in a lot of ways, trying to make the best of it that it can. 
All right, so we're going to get into the nuances here momentarily. But before we do, Alex, do you agree with that general characterization? I mean, I, the press was pretty uniform about saying, hey, the Biden administration split this $7 billion in frozen assets in half, and it's, you know, kind of going to give half of it to relief through some kind of third party, and it's going to give the other half to 9-11 victims. Scott says it's not really what happened here. Who's right? Ben, thanks so much, and Scott, for having me. And I think there's not a ton of daylight. Um, Scott gave a really, really fantastic summary, and, and I think we share the similar view that this is a really hard policy and legal issue that is is difficult to communicate in the first instance. And I think the response from media, but particularly within the uh, Afghan American community, the Afghan community, and among the humanitarian community, was particularly uh, misinformed. I think I think they missed the call of what the Biden administration is attempting to do, and imputed a lot of motivations that I don't think is correct based on my my view, my understanding, uh, having worked at the Treasury Department, in having worked at the White House under the Obama administration, as well as having served in Afghanistan leading the Treasury Department office. And the the tenor and the characterization of my interactions with current government officials, with those involved in the plaintiff's litigation as well, you know, I think this is a really challenging set of uh, legal and policy issues that the, the, the Biden administration has really been grappling with over the past six months. And we're just starting to see some indications of their position, um, as Scott mentioned, with this filing, the statement of interest in the plaintiff's litigation, and then the concurrent executive order fact sheet, and then background briefing. But I, I think also, you know, there there's a lot going on right now within the Biden administration, within the Biden White House. And I think a lot of events are very consumed by Ukraine. And so less attention, maybe less preparation was undertaken that otherwise would have been preferred when rolling something out that is this complex and this nuanced. And so I think it's it's a little bit of function of circumstances as well uh, that does not put the Biden administration in particularly good light, but I am more sympathetic than than what the public calls have been for the analysis on on what what has actually happened and what is intended to happen by the Biden administration. All right, so let's start breaking this down. Alex, the 7 billion dollars is what? Where does it, where does it come from? What can we say about this large pot of money that was sitting in the New York Fed branch? Yeah, so it depends on how far back we want to go. But at the last hop in the last stage, we can start on August 14th, um, the day before Kabul fell to the Taliban. This was the Afghan Central Bank, da Afghanistan Bank, or DAB. These were, it was their, uh, the foreign exchange reserves of the Afghan people held in custody by the Afghan Central Bank and for use by, for monetary policy purposes by the central bank. Um, which at the time was a relatively, fairly independent central bank. And it was aligned with an allied and partner government under the Ghani administration in Afghanistan. The, a layer back behind that, I mean, over the past several years, um, Afghanistan, you know, has over the past 20 years, Afghanistan has benefited from substantial international donor assistance. And part of that money and part of other funds that were revenues that were raised by the Afghan government were placed in the central bank and were then moved to New York to be invested, to be used for other discretionary purposes by the central bank. And so the, the $7 billion that were parked in New York at its final stage before the funds were either blocked or frozen or otherwise uh, encumbered by the Biden administration on or about August 15th were the funds that were custodied and controlled by the Afghan Central Bank under the Ghani administration. And as you can tell, there were a lot of qualifiers there. I mean, it's it's a it's not a straightforward answer. Scott, why isn't you have seven billion dollars in assets? The recognized government has disintegrated. Why isn't the right answer that the New York Fed puts a freeze on that money and nobody touches it until there's a recognized government of Afghanistan. Well, you know, it's not clear that that is the wrong answer. And that is actually kind of the federal government's default position 
to, with a lot of qualifiers. But essentially, that's what happened on August 15th. There was no longer recognized government. Uh, the Biden administration made very clear, look, we don't recognize the Taliban's claims that they are the new Afghan government. We don't accept those. Uh, you, they do not have the authority to direct the DAB or any other Afghan institution. So until we have a recognized government in place, nobody really has the authority to direct these sort of transactions. The downside of that, the real hindrance of it, and this applies not just in this case, but lots of other cases where we have these kinds of transitions, is that countries really rely on these funds for a variety of things. Um, you know, They use these funds for a lot of economic policy, about stabilizing their currency, facilitating foreign trade. In, in many cases, I don't know if it's a specific issue here, but I know in other cases where states have found themselves in a situation where there's been a, an uprising or another event, you know, they've had foreign assets that they rely rely on to pay civil servants and to do a lot of basic government functions overseas stuck in a bank where they're not able to access it. And so the United States sometimes takes positions that tries to work solutions where they can free up kind of certain parts of these assets for certain select purposes. And that's kind of what I think is happening here, more or less, although in a slightly different way. The reason why it's happening different here, though, is because you have the Taliban. It's actually rising to government here. It's a heavily, heavily sanctioned entity, not just by the United States, but also internationally, for whom the United States has, uh, and we can debate the legitimacy of it, but I think most people would accept there's at least some legitimacy to it historically, legitimate concerns that they would use assets and resources provided to them in ways that would be contrary to U.S. policy interests, in particular relating to terrorism. So in this case, uh, you know, the default really was we're holding these assets kind of in abeyance or in the state of uh, suspended anim animation, but that fed into the broader economic crisis that Afghanistan has been facing these last six months. I, I think it probably goes too far to say it's the thing that triggered it, or perhaps even that it is a, ma a main or the major contributor. Afghanistan has always had a dysfunctional economy, heavily relying on foreign assistance, almost all of which wrapped up after the um, fall of the government in Kabul, you know, also got cut off to a variety of international resources because there was no recognized government. So, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a more complicated picture. But nonetheless, a lot of people look at these assets and say, these could be really useful for a government facing an economic and humanitarian crisis, and they don't have access to them. Does that sound right to you, Alex? I think you know the specifics of Afghanistan better than I do. Yes, yeah, no, that's a very fair characterization. And so I think that the freezing of these assets or their encumbrance and inability to be used, you know, was feeding into this broader narrative, um, despite U.S. government efforts um, to issue general licenses and frequently ask questions for the scope and the, the purpose of OFAC economic sanctions, despite working at the U.N. to create sanctions relief and, for other countries to, to implement within their domestic regimes. Um, the U.S. government has committed over $308 million, um, more, most recently through USAID, for additional humanitarian assistance. So these efforts were being very much undermined, uh, one, by the, the ongoing existence of sanctions against the Taliban Haqqani network. And then secondly, um, the existence of these $7 billion. It was a very visceral and very concrete understanding that people felt, and many Afghans and many um, humanitarian organizations saw this as a, another area of inconsistent U.S. government policy. Um, and just a major source of potential uh, assistance that was not being used and was actually prevented from being used under unknown legal or policy or legal and policy rationales. All right. So all of that would be complicated enough. How did the 9-11 families get involved with this? So the 9-11 families, uh, and I should say it's not all 9-11 families. In fact, it's, it's a couple of groups of plaintiffs that include not just individuals affected by 9-11, meaning individuals who were injured or the family members and estates of people killed. It also includes property owners. It also includes insurance companies in some cases. But there are a bunch of these groups of plaintiffs um, that have been pursuing litigation against really a wide variety of parties who they maintain have some responsibility for the 9-11 attacks since the attacks happened or really after the attacks happened. Um, they've targeted uh, Iran. They've actually sued the government of Iraq uh, in some of these litigations. Uh, they sued a lot of private individuals like Osama bin Laden, among others, and they have sued the Taliban. The problem you ran into here is that the Taliban, like some of those other defendants, but not like others, the Taliban generally has not appeared to defend itself in U.S. federal courts. 
And that results in what is commonly called the default judgment, which is where really the court issues a judgment basically saying, well, no one is here to provide the counter argument to what the plaintiffs are presenting to me. So, so far as they, as long as they present a kind of baseline satisfactory case, I'm going to give them a judgment in the amount that they asked for. And they're going to be able to enforce that judgment just as if there's a judgment against the counterparty. There are ways to reopen default judgments if a party comes forward and shows good cause as to why they didn't choose to present themselves and make counter arguments in court. But the Taliban hasn't tried to do that so far. So a lot of these groups of plaintiffs have these default judgments. And these default judgments are absolutely huge in a lot of these cases in terms of damages. That is because the damages in the case of terrorist cases are often very substantial in and of themselves in terms of compensatory damages. In almost all these cases, the plaintiffs have also been awarded substantial punitive damages. That's basically damages that you can get on top of whatever harm you can show you suffer just to punish the other party because they've done something particularly bad. And I think terrorism is understandably seen as particularly bad. In one case, one of the statutes statutes that's used for many of these lawsuits, the Anti-Terrorism Act Civil Liability Provision, actually statutorily says you get treble damages, meaning triple damages. So you know whatever damages you got injured for $1,000 worth of harm, you are going to be awarded $3,000, uh, 2000 of which will be punitive, only 1000 which will be compensatory damages. So you get a number of these giant judgments. Of which, for example, one of the major groups of plaintiffs here, the judgment itself is actually for over $6 billion. So when the Taliban started asserting, oh, we are the government of Afghanistan, we now control the government's, the Afghanistan Central Bank, the DAB, these plaintiffs came to New York court and filed a writ of attachment saying, well, look, the Taliban says they now control these assets. Um, they're effectively theirs, although we can argue as to whether that's actually legally the same. I don't think it actually is. But they are essentially asserting, well, that's the same as if they own them. And we have a six plus billion dollar judgment against Afghanistan. And coincidentally, there's about six plus billion dollars in New York Federal Reserve Bank plus interest. So we're going to file and attach that. That's kind of what kicked off all these legal proceedings, because then you saw after the one group of plaintiffs did this that has, frankly, one of the larger outstanding judgments I'm aware of. You saw other plaintiffs begin, groups begin to jump in as well because they're worried that that first group is going to t seize all the money and that they won't be able to enforce their own judgments against it unless they get in line in court. So we've seen at least one other group of plaintiffs already file a writ of attachment. We've seen discussions from others that also have outstanding default judgments. Uh, and other judgments. They're not necessarily all default. I'm not sure they are. Uh, and we've also seen rumblings coming from other groups of plaintiffs that are actively pursuing litigation against the Taliban and uh, the state of Afghanistan that haven't come to resolution yet, but suggesting that, well, we should hold some of these assets in abeyance for us in case we get a judgment in the end. Um, and I should note for note of disclosure, I was an expert witness for the now defunct Islamic Republic of Afghanistan in one of those cases on totally unrelated issues. But I want to note that here for the sake of disclosure. All right. So there's a lot in there. But before we go on, I just want to clarify. So if the Biden administration had done nothing, what happens? You have the Fed Bank, Reserve Bank in New York saying, we're not going to let the Taliban withdraw this, uh, both for sanctions reasons and because they're not the recognized government. You have a bunch of plaintiffs uh, filing writs of attachment, what happens if the Biden administration had not issued an executive order and stepped in? Does it? Does the money just sit there? Does some court in New York get to take away this money from the New York Fed and give it to 9-11 uh, families? Or what's the default disposition here? So essentially, the default disposition would be that these plaintiffs would be able to pursue their legal arguments as to why they're entitled to these assets before a federal court in New York, in the Southern District of New York. And the judge would issue a ruling. And if they were found to be entitled to those assets, they would be transferred to their custody. The same way as if you're attaching any other asset for in pursuit of a civil judgment against any other kind of private uh, party. The thing that's different, I guess, about the Biden executive order is that it sets up a slightly different structure for how those assets are held. It actually consolidates the assets in New York Federal Reserve Bank for certain litigation management and strategic reasons. But the more fundamental issue is that it's trying to sit shrink the whole bundle of assets that are subject to those sorts of proceedings from the full $7 billion down to 
three and a half billion because it's taken the other three and a half and saying we're going to put this in this committed third party trust fund. But the legal arguments would have been the same. The same, the ability to actually try and attach these assets would be the same. It's not an open and shut case by any means. There are a lot of serious legal reasons to think that the plaintiffs will not be successful at this. But it's also not clear that they won't be successful. Um, there are aspects in which they have an argument. It's kind of an unprecedented factual situation. It involves a lot of complicated laws, and I don't think anybody can say with absolute certainty which way the court's going to go. So uh, those options are still available to those plaintiffs now as they were before the Biden EO, but it's for a smaller overall pot of money. And one other difference that, that I think is worth making here is that now that the executive order has put those assets under a degree of protection, the Justice Department is involved in filing statements of interest uh, and presumably is going to be involved further in litigation in regard to these assets. That's notable here because actually from what I can tell, having looked through the dockets for these cases, and I may have missed it, but I don't think I did, I don't think that anyone's actually stepped up to represent the DAB in any of this litigation. Meaning if it was just the plaintiffs, the United States actually hadn't intervened and filed a statement of interest or, or taken this executive order action, the would have been another one-sided argu argument, kind of like with the default judgments. It doesn't make it automatic. Like They would still have to make a case, and they could still lose on the law before the court. But you would have seen a much more one-sided argument in which um, you know, I think the DAB would have been at disadvantage uh, for not having anyone to kind of make its case for its legal defenses on its behalf. Um, now, the Justice Department is kind of doing that and has done so that through its statement of interest, and presumably is going to have to wrestle with those issues as it defends its IEPA-imposed limitations uh, moving forward. All right. So, Alex... The more I hear Scott talk, the more I think that the only problem with what the administration did is that they left three and a half billion there rather than giving all of the seven billion to some third party entity to spend on relief in Afghanistan. On the one hand, you have uh, starving people and you don't want the Taliban to have access to the money, but it is the Afghan people's money and it should presumably be spent to satisfy uh, their immediate tangible needs. On the other hand, you have a select group of plaintiffs who have kind of glommed onto this pot of money to satisfy judgments that are not necessarily more compelling than a lot of other judgments that people might have. So my question is, what's the policy argument for hiving off only half of this money and leaving the other half to be attached or potentially be attached and fight about that on its own merits basis, uh, rather than just yanking it all out and making it available for uh, Afghan relief? Ben, that's a great question. Um, in, in the spirit of, of full disclosure, uh, in prior roles, I worked on behalf of 9-11 and other victims of terrorism, um, on, not on um, these specific matters, um, active matters or where the, where the government intervened, but familiar with the issue sets. And, you know, I think my, my understanding framed by that, framed by my time in government, uh, is that I think this was a good faith effort by the Biden administration to in a very uh, kind of finding some some good options out of or okay options out of least worst options. Um, and I think this was a good faith proposal to the victims of 9-11. Um, and I think they're they are American citizens. Um, I think they're you know, they have very strong legal rights in the United States. And they also have very strong constituencies among elected officials and other parts of, of the U.S. government. And so I think that's one element that needs to be appreciated here is that 9-11 that victims, you know, have, are a constituency and have support outside, just outside of the, the courts. And I want to add one, th I think everything Alex said is exactly right, but I think it's worth flagging one other aspect, uh, a specific legal aspect here is that taking too many of the assets away from these proceedings that are ongoing actually could put the U.S. government in legal peril for the simple reason that you have a case here where a bunch of individual plaintiffs who are many former American citizens, if not well, probably almost all of them, I think they actually may all need to be at least US nationals under the ATA, I'm not sure about the other causes of action involved, that have claimed this interest in this sort of asset. If it were removed from them by the federal government, there could be a variety of claims around the federal government saying, well, here's why 
the government is doing something to deprive us of access to this, maybe in violation of due process, maybe in violation of the takings clause, that could come back and bite the Biden administration. Uh, we tend to think of the executive branch's sanctions authorities as entailing a ton of discretion, and they really do. But one area where they actually have some limits, and particularly often encounter litigation that can result in some limits, is when they affect individuals with constitutional rights, uh, which would almost certainly be the case here. And you can see this in the executive order itself. The executive order is very careful uh, and even addresses the fact that some of these plaintiffs may arguably have had interests in these assets already by virtue of these legal proceedings they started um, because they are specifically addressed on the executive order to say, well, we couldn't give you notice because XYZ policy finding reasons. They do that and it kind of tacitly acknowledges, hey, these people might have some sort of legal cognizable interest in this. So the reason why I think they split in half, frankly, is because they did the math and said, look, $3.5 billion ish, uh, meaning like the the remainder of, of, of whatever this over 7 billion is minus 3, 5 billion transferred to benefit the Afghans should be enough to cover the compensatory damages for a lot of these claims that we're aware of right now. I'm sure they have lots of wiggle room, lots of buffer room built in there, and we can get into why they're focusing on compensatory damages versus punitive damages, because there's a big delta between those two in the case of the, most of these uh, litigations and judgments. But I think they counted and said, like, we can present to the court saying, we think this is more than adequate for the purposes of resolving these ongoing proceedings. Meanwhile, we can take the rest of this and make sure it gets to the Afghans and put it, frankly, in a third-party source where if the Taliban does assert control over it or something else happens, it's not going to be as readily subject um, to getting sucked into these sorts of legal proceedings. So I think there's actually a strategic element to this, not just, although I think everything Alex said is quite right. I think the Biden administration itself wants to make clear it's not hostile to um, these claims by 9-11 victims who, who have strong political support and are very sympathetic for, for all the, the reasons one might be aware. So I want to at the risk of sounding hostile to 9-11 victims, which I certainly am not, I want to push back against the premise here, which is that, you know, you have this pot of money and you have these different claimants to a pot of money that are roughly equally situated. So you kind of split the money. And that seems to me to be a pretty hard premise to defend here. Uh, first of all, Afghanistan, as I understand it, was not the defendant in this litigation, right? This was a litigate. These were litigations where the Taliban or some Taliban affiliated entity is the subject of the of the judgment. Is that right, Scott? Yeah, that's right. Um, there is some ongoing litigation specifically against Afghanistan, although it still relates to actions of the Taliban. But the judgments are against the Taliban, as far as I'm aware. Uh, maybe there are some against Afghanistan. So here you have sovereign assets of the nation of Afghanistan, the Afghan Central Bank. And you have a genuine famine starting in Afghanistan. And you have a judgment against an organization that is not the organization that operates the, you know, that we recognize as the government of Afghanistan. It seems to me like if you acknowledge that you can seize these assets to satisfy that those judgments, you're effectively recognizing the Taliban as the government, no? Well, that actually like really gets down to the core legal issues. And these are the exact sorts of legal and factual questions that the plaintiffs involved in this litigation are going to have to argue over and make a case for before the New York courts to be able to attach these assets. Like I said, I don't think it is uh, clear that they're going to be successful at that. There's a good chance, I think, that they are not successful and these assets remain in the possession of the DAB, if for no other reason that their position hinges really upon the Taliban's mere assertion that it is the new government of Afghanistan and runs contrary to the Biden administration's well-established position that it does not recognize the Taliban as the government of Afghanistan. And usually the executive branch's recognition determinations are subject to pretty pretty extensive deference by the courts. But they might have arguments. There, there are some arguments back and forth uh, around sovereign immunity issues, some other issues where the plaintiffs obviously think they have some sort of case to present here and be made. And I think they're going to lay it out there. The Biden administration makes clear that, look, we're leaving this $3.5 billion in place so that you have the opportunity to make those arguments just as you would if we had enacted at all. We're not taking that away from you. We're trying to do something with the much 
the other part of this big bucket of funds that you don't need to be able to see through the end of your process that that really shouldn't be touched by this process in the first place. Uh, and it's worth noting a big part of that is because the only way that they, even if you know, the Taliban were the government of Afghanistan, and this were all sort of Afghanistan asset or Afghanistan conduct and culpability. Central bank assets usually get really strong uh, sovereign immunity protections. The only really way it seems like these plaintiffs could get to the central bank assets is under a law called uh, the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act of 2002. And it only provides a carve out in very narrow circumstances for terrorism related conduct to compensatory damages, meaning damages that are kind of like one-to-one making someone whole for harm they've suffered, not for punitive damages. So that's why even though one of these judgments is for six plus billion dollars, the Biden administration, I think, is asserting, no, but you only really need 3.5 billion court to resolve this because they can only even hope in the best of cases to get be able to attach compensatory damages, which is just a fraction of less than a third, in this case, that particular judgment. So it's that sort of legal calculus going through all these different possible issues that's really feeding into this debate. All right. So Alex, one of the other things that is feeding into this debate is just the sense of a lot of the groups associated with this conversation that the administration just kind of hived off half of Afghanistan's money in the U.S. and is giving them to 9-11 victims, which is unrelated to the current plight of the Afghan people. Understanding that, as you and Scott have explained, it's actually, the, the facts are actually a lot more complicated than that. How much feeding of the Afghan people is half of this money going to be able to do and what do you think is the right approach for the U.S. government right now to be thinking about uh, how to provide assistance without enabling the Taliban? Is, is this pot of money a good, a, a good pool to be doing that with in the first place? This amount of money, and this was never intended to be used for humanitarian or development assistance. This money was, you know, for monetary policy, it was for uh, potentially for import coverage uh, in the event of a crisis, but it wasn't the 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 operating account, the expense account, um, or the operating budget for Afghanistan, uh, which was heavily reliant on donor assistance. Right, at least seventy five percent plus of public expenditures uh, were internationally funded, forty percent roughly of GDP. This is all pre August fifteen figures were coming from international donors. That effectively all stopped on around August fifteenth. And so this was never the the pot of money or the pool that provided that support. And and so the international community is figuring out a response mechanism. Uh, The World Bank has repurposed some funding, around 280 million so far, from the 1.5 roughly billion Afghanistan Reconstruction Trust Fund, which is a donor funding mechanism. Um, The EU has committed about a billion dollars to Afghanistan and its neighbors, or sorry, a billion three, a billion euros um, to Afghanistan's neighbors, particularly to help on refugee uh, outflows. And so, you know, and then the UN appeal has called for at least 4.4 billion, um, but it could be substantially more than that for uh, for additional assistance. So there there are other ways to fund this, and so you know there is appropriations through the U.S. government. Um, there is the international community, and so you know I'm just saying this isn't the only mechanism by which the U.S. government uh, can support the Afghan people or returning these funds for the Afghans to support themselves. And so, so with that, I mean, I think the, there is a huge problem with corruption, with waste, fraud, and abuse in Afghanistan, as well as absorptive capacity under the prior administration. And I think that's even more acute under the Taliban control of, of the territory, you know, in conjunction with the Haqqani network. And so we're, you know, I, I think there needs to be a very robust framework for oversight, for enforcement, and for monitoring of where these funds, if they are in fact released, through this trust fund um, proposal by the Biden administration, how that money is is used and dispersed. But I, I think you know that there's just more of a wishful thinking among many within Afghanistan and outside that there wasn't a policy alternative or legal possibility that the Biden administration through fiat could just cut a $7 billion check to the Taliban. Um, and that is fanciful and just unrealistic under the present circumstances. I also think it's worth flagging that the Biden administration has been very 
open and transparent, frankly, about the fact that they actually have no idea what they're going to do with this $3.5 billion. They basically have said it's going to be used for the benefit of the Afghan people. And they subject, they've they mentioned humanitarian assistance. They've mentioned some other things. And uh, they noted specifically in an OFAC license that got issued at the same time the executive order that you know maybe we'll transfer it to UN body or to some international financial institution where it's the US as a member. It's just not going to the Taliban. Like That's the one thing they've been very clear about, that they're going to set it up in a way that doesn't get to the Taliban. I'm not sure that means that it necessarily has to be directly transferred for direct humanitarian assistance, Um, because there are other ways to do that sort of assistance. It's not clear that's actually the best way to do it, particularly when you're talking about central bank assets that actually like the holding and availability of them for certain economic policy reasons actually can bring a lot of value. I, I actually think it's entirely legally possible that they may set up a trust fund arrangement that does a lot of the same things with these assets that the, a functioning central bank might have done and tries to do them in a way, or at least in a way that might help the larger economic situation of Afghanistan, query whether it will be able to, but at least try to do so, but does it, does it without handling control over the Taliban? I think that's a tall order. I think it'd be very hard to implement. It require a lot of coordination over a variety of things, including probably with the Taliban to some extent. But it would allow for some use of these assets that maybe accomplishes some of the same goods that they may have been used for if they had stayed with the central bank and the central bank had been able to continue to function. Long story short, I I think the Biden administration is deliberately keeping it open to say, we need to figure out what the best thing to do with these assets. But the transfer, the reason they're doing it right now is to both make clear, look, we're taking a big part of these assets and holding it for the benefit of Afghans. Not all of this can be subject to attachment for these sorts of proceedings. And they filed a statement of interest in federal court, basically making the case that this $3.5 billion we moved out isn't subject to the TRIA, Terrorism Risk Insurance Act exception that I mentioned earlier, that seems to be the vehicle by which these plaintiffs are trying to get at these assets. Uh, now, they're waiting for the courts to weigh in and say, that's right. And they've said, we're going to have to wait a few weeks or months for the courts to confirm we have a right interpretation because they're trying to, I think, play legally nice and not step on my toes here. But I think the bigger issue here is to try and actually take these assets and put them in a area where they have some greater legal protections from potential attachment and to make clear, like these are going to be for the Afghans benefit. I don't think it necessarily means that, you know, they're going to be used just to buy food and humanitarian assistance. They could be used for all sorts of purposes. All right. So I want to sketch out what I think is a kind of best case scenario from the administration's point of view and a worst case scenario, both of them, as I understand it, consistent with the disposition that they've suggested. So best case scenario is they figure out a a smart third party mechanism for this money, either for direct relief or for some other use of this money Uh, for the benefit of the Afghan people. Uh, They give it immediately three and a half billion dollars and they file uh, motions objecting to the attachment of the assets, uh, the remaining three and a half billion along the lines that we've discussed. They prevail and thus free up another three and a half billion or some substantial part of it to be added to that fund later. Do you guys think this is my the optimistic scenario from the administration's point of view? Do you think that this is effectively encapsulates what the policy objective is? Like, if, if they could get that, is that what they're trying for? You know, I think just the the factual foundation or the background is is a little bit helpful here. I mean, the Biden administration needed to respond to this litigation. You know, they had filed to provide a statement of interest. That was due in December. They asked for additional time in January. They asked for additional time. Like the, the clock was up. We're at the six month mark from when these funds have been, you know, under under um, some form of blocking or freezing. And so there needed to be a disposition. And this allows the Biden administration to continue to develop its policy response um, without, you know, w- w- by providing an option that you described. And so I think that's, I think we don't know where this is going to go, but the ability to repurpose all seven billion in an ideal situation for the Biden administration um, seems like a reasonable outcome um, if if that's what they're trying to solve for. And Scott, I don't know if you feel differently about that. No, I, I think that's 
That's probably right. But one thing I think it's worth making clear, though, is like the Biden administration is really going to pains to make clear that they are neutral, trying to remain neutral in regards to these plaintiff's efforts insofar as they have legal merit. They filed a statement of interest that says, here are all the legal issues that the plaintiffs have to overcome. They're not like clearly arguing against them necessarily, but they are highlighting, look, these are all a lot of big legal questions raised by their actions. I think they're all legitimate and valid. Like they're the same legal questions that I had when I first was reading about this the other week. They also have basically said, look, we are policy-wise neutral on whether you succeed on this or not. This is like maybe the con- kind of concession you get a little bit to the 9-11 plaintiffs in the statement of interest. It kind of, you read it, read it and it says basically like, look, we, from a policy perspective, like we're not going to take a position one way or the other, whether it's good or bad, that they they get these assets. And I think part of that has to do with a lot of the sensitivities around uh, victims of terrorism. Again, the fact that they're highly sympathetic and a very strong base of support in both political parties and, and in Congress. And again, in a lot of ways for, for good reasons. There's a lot of genuinely sympathetic people who have been through very, very difficult circumstances and deserve, you know, to, to some extent to be made whole. Query whether this is the best way to do that. The issue here, though, is from the Biden administration. So, so saying what's its best perspective or not, I don't think it would necessarily go that far saying we are, but we want this, we want the plaintiffs to not get any of this money. I think they're saying we're trying to remain neutral about this. What we are trying to do is we're going to leave enough money where it is so that you guys can finish your proceedings. But you don't have an argument that it reaches all $7 billion, And we've got to make sure some of the, the remainder of the $7 billion, what you don't need to resolve those outstanding proceedings is put in a position where it we know it's going to go to the benefit of the Afghan people. I think that's closer to how they would articulate the balance of equities here. Gotcha. The way you have answered that question actually moots the second scenario. But let me touch on it briefly. The second scenario is, you know, these assets get attached in substantial part, the the half for the, the 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 three and a half billion remaining get a, attached and used to satisfy this judgment, and they cannot figure out an effective way of of disposing of the three and a half billion that they've tried to insulate, and you end up with a sort of Cuba like situation of uh, assets attached for very uh, or assets frozen for very long periods of time. Is there Alex, a good basis for confidence that we're going to be able to find a way to spend uh, $3.5 billion for the benefit of the Afghan people, given the current governance there? I know the administration is thinking very hard about this, and they're, I think there's a, they're, they're, they're working on it. So we don't know where this will, will lead to, but I believe that you know, there, is, there is space for it, um, and there's absolutely need for it. And so I think they want to exhaust all possibilities and find you know, have a little bit more time to find additional vehicles, uh, additional ways to provide benefit to the to the Afghan people, as Scott mentioned. And so we just, you know, I think time, will, unfortunately, will only tell on this one. I, I, I don't have a crystal ball on this. We are going to leave it there. Alex Zerden, Scott R. Anderson, thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our audio engineer this episode is Hamza Situ of Goat Rodeo. You, if you are not yet a material supporter of Lawfare, should become one. You know you want to. You can appear on the Lawfare Podcast as part of our live audiences. You can attend all the Lawfare live events, and you can get ad-free versions of the Lawfare podcast and our other podcast offerings. You can do it at patreon.com slash lawfare. The Lawfare podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, thanks for listening.